Hi, everyone. My name is Jim Stinger, and I'm the president of the San Francisco chapter of the Society of West Coast Artists. And if you're not a member, we invite you to join. We can always use more new members, more of you to watch our demos and to hang pictures in our gallery. So please check us out at our website, societyofwest-coastartists.com. And today for our demo, we have David Lobenberg. David Lobenberg's high level of excellence in figurative landscape watercolor and acrylic painting is well recognized by artists and collectors nationwide. He has completed commissioned works for the United States Air Force, Thunderbirds Alumni Association, the Amgen Tour of California, the Sacramento Kings and River Cats, Major League Baseball players Barry Zito and Nick Swisher, IMAX Corporation and SureWest Corporation, to name a few. He teaches year-round at art workshops in California and out of state. David Lobenberg has a master's degree in fine arts from UCLA and is an adjunct art professor at Sacramento City College. His work has been reproduced in American Artist, Southwest Art, and American Art Collector magazines and Pratique de Art. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to David to tell us more about his demo and himself. Okay, thank you, Jim. And the only correction I want to give you is I am now a retired adjunct art professor that taught at Sacramento City College. I probably gave you uh, old information. But anyway, but that comes into, um, that's, that's going to come into what I'm about to say. Uh, you can see I, I'm, I'm sharing uh, my YouTube channel screen here because I want to show you how my, my California Vibe watercolor portraiture pieces uh, evolve from drawing to the final painting. And that's basically what I've been teaching for at least, I don't know, I lose track of time, eight years at least, um, all across the country, a little into Canada. They, They've mostly all been my California Vibe watercolor portraiture workshops. So what I do is I will uh, get a subject. And by the way, I get most of my subjects now off of an app called, um, uh, it's called Museum, Sketchy Museum. Sketchy is a company that uh, produced this app. Uh, it's a wonderful app because 24 seven, all year round, people from all over will send in photographs of themselves in hopes that an artist will render their image, which is kind of cool. And so there are no legalities about this. They, they give their full approval. So you see faces, once you get on the app, you can see photographs just 24 seven. It, it never stops. So this was a photograph that I got. This subject, this male subject was from sketchy and it started out as a photograph now at sacramento city college for 17 years i taught drawing um classes i know how to draw very well but i'm not interested in the drawing part i know drawing uh we all have our different styles um and i have a style of tracing a very, uh, I, I do lines that are very, I have a lot of personality, but they are traced because I start with a photograph. And like I said, this male subject, uh, I'm not showing you the photograph right now, I'm showing you the tracing, but the tracing came from a photograph from Sketchy or the or the or their app is called Museum. Um, and I just use a soft Ticonderoga pencil and what I do is I'll pull off an image from Sketchy onto my desktop. I'll make an eight by 10 print. And then um, I will put tracing tissue paper or vellum right on top. I have a light table. Uh, and I trace all the basic salient uh, shapes of the facial features, the hair, you know, the head structure. So that's what you're seeing now on my YouTube channel. And I, 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 I put a fair amount of pressure on my pencil. Sometimes I press real hard. Sometimes I lighten up a little. But 
I like to see the pencil peeking out for my final painting. So it's not like I want to keep it nice and light to hide my pencil sketch. That gets incorporated within my California vibe style of painting. Then what I do, and I develop this to get people in my workshops over the fear of color and over the fear of letting watercolor do what it does best. And what it does best, it likes to flood the paper. Watercolor, the process of watercolor painting is controlling the flood, underscore flood. So I developed The Mess Around. The Mess Around uh, is a song from uh, Ray Charles uh, many years ago. It's got a lot of energy. And you can put the same type of energy into the mess around. So anyway, I'm going to turn on this video. I'm not going to show you the whole video, but you're going to see the mess around part. Okay, that... Up until right, right here, that's a mess around. So basically I take the primary colors. I take red and I like to use, I like to use a lot opera. I take yellow, cad yellow light, and I take ultramarine blue green shade. And I just pop them on any old which way, it doesn't matter. You can spray them on, you can slap them on with a brush. And then I will take a, um, and you can do it wet on wet, you can do it wet on dry. Uh, and I put them on fairly strong, and then I take a sprayer. Let's look at it one more time. I don't know if I did the spray. Yeah, I, I'm sure I did. And I lift up the paper and I let it flow. So that at the very end, you have this, if I can use a 19th century word, I love 19th century words. You end up with a miasma of flooded, mixing, mingling colors. And that's what watercolor does best. Oh, and by the way, they're of course transparent, translucent colors. And you end up with a beautiful abstract painting. You don't care where the highlights in the subject should go. You care about nothing. In fact, you can do this before you even do your tracing. So you're not influenced by anything. You do want to leave a little bit of the white of the paper, but where the white of the paper is, where they're going to be located, that just happens by pure accident. And here's the key. You cannot go beyond mid value. Because after this is all dry, after the mess around is all dry, and it's going to—it's even going to dry a little lighter. But it's—it's it's on a scale from one, a zero being the white of the paper to ten being your darkest value. It's not going to go. It's going to be somewhere if you do it right between four and five. It's going to have a range of values from three. You know, you can only get so dark with a yellow or an opera. So you can really put that on thick, but you gotta be careful with phthalo blue. You can't get those phthalo blues getting too dark because what happens next is I go from mid to dark values and I pull out, I, am, I like to call it, I emerge the subject from the mess around. In fact, let me show you. So you saw how it started. Let me go right to the end. Oops, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me freeze that. So there you go. Started with a mess around and you end up with a, a male subject. So that is what I'm going to try and fit in today in two hours. I'm going to stop sharing. There we go, okay. Um, Hey Jim, I'm I'm gonna let you do it. Can you uh can you uh, spotlight my tabletop, and then I can I can I can see what I'm doing. I also have a camera above uh, my painting tabletop. 
Do okay. I hit speaker? I've, I've pinned your tabletop. Oh, okay. Let me go back to gallery. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to try and do this myself. If I go to speaker, no, that's you. I can, hey, Jim, I can't see it on my end. It's not big. It's still a, a small screen. And, you know, if it is, that's okay. Well, I'm trying to enlarge yeah. it. On, on my screen, I have pinned your tabletop and I see it large. Then that's good enough. Okay. Is okay. That, does everybody else see it large? No. Okay. I haven't done Zooms in a while. I've done so many Zooms, I should be able to know how to do this. Hmm. Okay. Well. Nope. Spotlight oh, for everyone. Wait a minute, I got it, I did it. You got it? Yeah, can everybody else see? Yeah. No. No. I pinned it myself and it was large. It became large. Oh, you did it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, who's talking? Is that you, Laura? Laura? Laura. Okay, Sharon, I see Sue. I see Sue Sue. Can can you guys do it as well? I don't well, want you to miss anything. I I now have made it spotlighted for everyone. Does everyone see the, the tabletop see large? Yeah. Okay. I think okay. I think we're good to go. Good. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Um, when I paint, just like just like I said in the mess around, I, I don't like lots of colors. As an artist, you should be able to you should get used to and be able to mix colors. So all you really need are the primaries. So I use a CAD yellow or CAD yellow light. You can use almost any yellow, just so long as it's primary yellow. And then I use an opera. I like to use a darker, uh, opera is a cool red, believe it or not, that's a cool red. And this is a lizard red. It's a deeper value cool red. So, so that, so, so far I only have three, and then I finish it off with phthalo blue, green shade, and either cobalt blue or ultramarine blue. And that's it. It's only five colors. And by the way, I, I, I paint exclusively with, um, it's La Aquarelle. It's a French brand uh, by Sennelier. And I like it because it's got a honey base to it. So if I want to pull out highlights, uh, honey base, it's easier to do. And then you can always add some of your favorite colors as let's call them adjunct colors. So in this case, I have, um, I forget the name of this. Oh, intense pink. It's kind of like an opera and a nice bright orange. So those are my colors and, uh, and I'm going to use those today. Um, here's my subject. Now, this started out as a mess around, but because I'm limited for time, I didn't want to do a mess around. I wanted to show you that video instead because a mess around, there's so much paint, it takes a while for it to dry. We didn't want to sit here watching it dry. And I hate using a hair dryer. I like to see the paint mix and mingle and settle down on its own volition. So I showed you that video, but this is all a mess around. Look at this nice bright yellow you can really pile on the paint thick because you're never going to go beyond medium value with like a yellow even even with some opera uh you, you can pile it on fairly thick now here i've got some orange that's been mixing the opera and the yellow mix you get orange uh here you can see some pure thalo blue but it's mixing with some yellow here by the way this is all random as i'm doing a mess around i see it just simply as an abstract, non-representational painting. I don't care where the highlights end up. 
Now, they happen to end up down here by our chin and a few random ones here and one up here and one up here. That's okay. Mess around, it's all random because you're always gonna be able to emerge that subject when you get to the mid, mid, mid values and the dark values and you're gonna see that. But see, I got some yellow mixing with the, uh, with the thalo and getting some beautiful greens. And here's some of the, be the, the pure ultramarine. But it all, oh, and I even got a, a, a somewhat of a, a blossom up here and there here. I love blossoms. Oh. It just adds to the texture and the richness and the visual variety of the final portrait. Um, and then, and I've never done this before. I, I you know, I'll, I'll, I only work on quarter sheets. I always have my original tracing. That's my master tracing. So I can trace this over and over and over again until the cows come home and constantly experiment with different techniques. So the technique I'm using today is I cut out strands of masking tape, these fine lines of masking tape. And I'm doing this, this directional thing going on. I have no idea what it's gonna look like. I don't care. Because I, I, I want you to see how I paint in the studio. I'm, I'm very brave and I just, I'm constantly experimenting. So we're all gonna find out together how, how this painting is eventually going to look. Um, and here's my subject. So it's from, it's from this photograph that I, and I got, I got her from Sketchy as well. It's this photograph that I put see-through vellum paper on top and did a sketch. That's my master sketch. And then you can blow that sketch up. You can enlarge it or reduce it at, at a copy service or on a digital projector. And that gets traced and you can see the tracing underneath the mess around. Just done with a Ticonderoga soft office pencil. This is very low tech. Okay. And then if, if I have time, I also have incorporated the use of stencils. In fact, let me show you here. This started as a mess around. Then I emerged the subject. This started with a mess around, only going at most to middle value. And then I emerged the subject by painting the darker areas of the nose, the mouth, the hair with mid to dark values. Voila, a portrait let the whole thing dry, and then I come back, I put a stencil on top, I tape it so it won't move, and I will take, I'm showing you all my secrets, I will take Mr. Clean, original, that's key, because they put chemicals in them now, but they still make original, I take Mr. Clean Magic Eraser, and I will pull off paint from out of these holes in the stencil. So that I get a pattern. Now you see some of these patterns. I've added green after I pull off the paint. I do that with chalk markers. Chalk markers is one of the uh, key ingredients in all my watercolors. And these chalk markers, they, they say that when you buy them, they say it's filled with. Um, with colored ink. Well, okay, they might say that, but whatever it's filled with, it comes awfully close or it is gouache. And gouache is simply watercolor paint, except it's more opaque. So if I have time, I'll also add, I'm, if I have time, I'll do a little bit of stenciling and I'll do some uh, chalk marking on it. So it's, it's quite the fun process. And, People all over it as I travel, they just love it. So let me put that aside. That's my reference photograph. What else have I got here? Oh, here's another older painting. This is Rick. He, he always adds photographs of himself on, um, uh, on the museum app. 
and people, there have been thousands of artists, that, including myself, that have painted him from one of his photographs. So you can see the stenciling I got on here. All this, this right here was done by taking the paint off of Mr. Clean, you know, within the openings in the stencil. But right here, this was a stencil with, with a matrix of little boxes. What I did with that is I put the stencil over his yellow shoulders and I will take a, 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 a pouncer or you, you can take a sponge and you put paint on the sponge or the pouncer and you pat the paint, it goes through the holes. So I call this negative stenciling and this is positive stenciling. Here's, a, here's one that's uh, really complex. I don't think that reflection is too bad. I use tape. All these long rectangular pieces, I put tape while I was doing the, the entire painting and then pulled off the tape and was left with these, these lighter areas. And then I came back with, a, with some stenciling going down the center here. It's got a directional thing. And then when that was dry, I added color in those parts where I pulled off the paint. So there's so much you can do. So now, time for me to paint. And I think what I'll do is I'll take down my painting. Um, I'm not going to show you the palette. I, I'm, I really don't want to get into color mixing. I, I, I want to show you what's key here is using middle to dark values and painting in the features and the hair and the neck area and the shoulders to pull out or to emerge the subject from the mess around. And I paint primarily on a uh, paper called Fabriano. It's manufactured by Fabriano in Italy. Fabriano, Fa, Fabriano, 140 pound Fabriano Artistico, either rough or cold press. This is on cold press. Okay, I may use a straw. This is a metal straw. We'll see if that comes into effect. And uh, of course, I use an X-Acto knife to cut out these long strips. And I've got brushes. I've got some small rounds that may come in handy. I've got a flat and I've got a um, cat's tongue. Okay, I'm going to start out with the eyes. And to make it simple, I'm just going to use one color to bring out the features. And I think that is going to be I think it's going to be a little bit here, I'll show you the palette. A little bit of alizarin red and a touch of phthalo blue. So I'm getting, and I and I can I can kind of have a range here. This is this is kind of a reddish purple. This is more coming into purple and 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 pure thalo blue. I'm giving myself a range right on the palette, or more pure alizarin. Let's start out with that first. I don't want it too dark. And I'm going to follow the values around the eye. I'm, go, I'm going to leave my lightest values. I'm probably not going to touch the, the, the paper at all there for the eyelids. I'll do the pupil and the lower eyelid. And I'll do a little bit of this darker value, which is the her other eye peeking from behind the bridge of her nose. 
So here we go. Oh, I love painting. I'm going to get it really dark. Right up to her eyebrow. And, and then it's going to get a little lighter. There we go. That looks good. There. Swing this around. Pretty dark here. Here. I'll get her the lower part of her upper eyelid. And then I'm going to, with some pure phthalo, I'm going to poke in. There, there's her pupil. I'm going to have to let this dry. I don't want to, well, no, that may be good. I'll leave that. Now I want to get lighter again. As we come around, this is the eye socket. So I want to get it lighter. Ah, perfect. I'm going to add a little bit of orange. Remember, I told you I have adjunct colors. This is orange. This is going to, whoa, that really brightens it up. Love that. Okay. And she's got two creases in her upper lid. Here's the other one. And then a little bit of dark area right here. As I'm painting, I'm very scrupulously observing my reference photograph. And I'm painting in the value patterns. And then this comes out a little lighter here. Maybe I'll get that a little bit darker. And that goes against the bridge of her nose. Yeah. Now, I haven't got the eye quite as defined, this edge right here. It's blending into the shadow, but that may be a good thing. So I'm going to leave that. I can always define that later. You don't want to stick on one area of the face and, 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 and get mesmerized by it. You want to continue your entire painting. And I don't care if this is a portrait a still life or a landscape. You want to see how everything works together. And then if you have to make corrections or changes, you go into that at a later stage. Okay, nice and dark right here. A little bit of the eye peeking through. And then I'll lighten it up with a very light touch of the alizarin. Maybe a little bit darker. And there's a little bit of an eyelash coming out. Actually, there's not much in the photograph, but I want to do an eyelash. There. So you can see now we've got, we've got an eye structure going. I'm going to soften this edge just a little bit. I'm just using a wet brush. Just soften it. There we go. Okay, now to the no. I don't want to get stuck on that. I don't want to get stuck on that. You want to see how everything goes together. Sometimes what doesn't look right, you don't think that you painted it quite right. You can do a little more, a little more, a little more, and then you wreck it. We've all done, we've all done that. And we continue to do it. I gotta all I gotta slap myself in the face when that happens. Okay, pretty pretty dark underneath the nose here. I'll go right through the nostril. I'm gonna add a little punch of orange on the tip of her nose. There. Now she's got a uh, she's got a kind of a high cheekbone. 
But I, 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 I think I'm going to refrain from getting into that. You know, as painters, we're allowed to abstract out details if it's going to be uh, if it's going to make a better painting. So I may abstract out that detail. Okay, now I'm going to dip into pure a little bit of thalo, a little bit of alizarin. I'm going to take off the paint. And I'm doing it by going into where the hair of the brush goes into the ferrule and soaking up water. Because I want to go here and do the nostril, but I want the paint thick and I don't, I don't want the brush too wet, otherwise it's going to spread all over the place. So this should work. Yeah, look at that. That's still wet. That area is still wet. But I had some thick paint, not too much water on my brush, and it doesn't spread out. That is a technique I, I, I got from a VHS tape a thousand years ago that was put out by the late great, I think he's the late great now, I think he passed away recently, you can correct me, uh, Tony Couch. He's a wonderful painter. Okay, now back to the lips. And I'm going to mix that with a little orange. Okay, so the lips. Somewhat dark upper lip. Light hits the, the top of the lower lip, so you don't, you don't want to make that too dark. But underneath the lower lip, heading into the chin, you get dark again. Always following, always looking at my reference photograph and following the value pattern. I see it's a little dark on the end here. But there is some reflected light on the upper lip, right there. And that may be enough. Now I just have a wet brush. I'm going to move some of this around there. And I'm going to take off a little paint with a dry brush. There. I think that may do it. Now, I'm going to wick out a bunch of water where the fibers, where the hairs of the brush go into the ferrule, so it's not too, too much flooded with water. And I'm going to go into a little bit of alizarin red and uh, phthalo blue. It's really thick on my brush. I mean, it is really thick because her mouth is parted, it's open a little bit. So I wanna get that in. There. And I'm keeping an eye on that lip. It's too, what if I hit it with a little bit of yellow? That gives me a highlight again. That looks good. And then with a wet brush, I'm going to hit this and just pull out a little bit of value. There, that softens that corner. Okay. Now she does have, as her lower lip turns around away from the light, look, it gets a little darker. I want to get that. So that's going to be, well, I got a lot of thick paint on there. Wow. Right there. And then with a wet brush, you know what we are, and I don't care what you paint, whether, again, whether it's a portrait, figurative, still life, a landscape. We're not painting. You don't have to name everything that you're painting. Trees, lake, nose, uh, flower, vase. Don't even think about it. Look at your whether it's in real life or look at your reference photograph, we are painting value shapes. And when you get into color, you can call them value shapes. That's, that's all we do as, as, as painters. In fact, it done, and, and that applies to anybody who uses an opaque medium. Okay, I'm gonna put just a little bit of 
There, that looks good. And bring this up a little towards the corner of the mouth. And that may be too much. So I clean my brush. It's it's wet, not too wet. And I'm just going to pull off a little paint, make it a little bit more subtle. There. Good enough. Good enough. Um, right on the edge of this part leading into the mouth, there's a little bit of a cast shadow from the bottom of the nose. It's a very subtle thing, but sometimes, especially with portraiture, these subtle things are important. So I'm going to try and get that. There. Okay, now we want to get this dark underneath her lower lip. So I'm I gotta get some more alizarin up here on my palette. Okay. Let's see if we can get that. And that goes right into the lower lip, comes down. Okay. Well, yeah, you know, I, I mean, look, I mean, look, look at the portrait, this female subject emerging. And, and I, I, I could have cared less where the color was. I could care less where I saved the whites of the paper. It doesn't matter. As long as you stay within mid-value range. You can have so much, you have so much freedom of color and, and the ability to come up with some really cool, interesting eye-catching portraits. There. Now what I'd like to get is that she's got really, she's got a really strong, she's got high cheekbones and a very strong jawline. I want to get that jawline. So what does that mean? That means I got to go in with a fairly dark value and soften it. I don't want a hard line. So let's start out with alizarin and a little mixture of that phthalo so we can get kind of a purplish color. It starts out about right here. Press down on the brush. Now, before that dries, I'm going to take a clean brush. It's got a little bit of water, and I'm just going to kiss the edge like this. And it will soften the jawline. Yeah, hit it with a little bit of orange here. Clean brush again, just kiss this, bring this around. Okay, I'm gonna get it even darker right here at the neck level as we go in the neck. Hey, time for a bigger brush. If you're painting in a large area, put that lousy tiny brush aside. It's so easy to get into trouble that way. Go in and, and just get the job done with a bigger brush. And I, I want all of this area to be, see, I, I got rid of that highlight there. Look, I got some paint traveling up there. Don't like that. So I'll take a dry brush and get rid of some of that. Okay. Now this is really wet and I'm not thoroughly happy. Oh, you, it looks like you're getting a reflection right here. That's not the white of the paper. Anyway, um, it, it's really wet. I'm not totally happy with it, but it's getting close. So I'm going to stop and let it dry. 
Because if you've got an area that's wet and you try and fix it, everything just keeps on spreading out and it gets to be a muddled mess. So I've learned over the years to, date, to tell myself, hey, David, cut it out, let it go, come back and work on it after it's dry. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. Okay, now I'm to the really difficult part. I want to get the hair. And I want to save some of my mess around colors. I figured with these lines, when I take them off, you're going to see some of those original colors. And I'm thinking the front of her hair, let's not get that too dark. In fact, maybe we, we might want to keep it just a deeper, darker, maybe just a deeper, darker yellow. Uh, and that may be enough. Because really, her, you know, hair reflects lots of light. Look at all the light that it's reflecting here and, and the highlights on the hair. And the front of her hair is fairly light. It's reflecting light. So I'm going to, I think I'll go into the orange and a little bit of yellow. I'll show you. See, I've mixed orange and yellow. You know, you even pull off a little red. So let's go in there. We definitely want it a little darker around the temple because that's going to define the temple or her, actually her forehead. Oh, and especially, especially under here where it's flipping out, it's being protected somewhat from the light. And also it's defining her forehead. So that works out real nice for me as a painter. There. It's got to be softened just a little bit more. Getting a lot of traveling of that paint. As you paint, you want to get used to keeping a third eye on different sections. Because you can really uh, fix things and control things a lot better before they thoroughly dry. Okay. Let's go to some pure yellow now. And a little bit of little dark strand of hair here, and especially up here. There. So I'm getting I'm getting this deep, a little bit of deep value here, and then right up here on the top. You know, the thing with painting is you don't have to copy. I, I you know, there, there are painters out there that are really good at photographic, realistic painting. Good for them, but that is definitely not my cup of tea. There, I better not overwork that too much. I'm going to lighten that up a little. I think that's enough. Okay, let's continue. Hey, are there any questions? Okay. Uh, David? Yes. Do, do you ever paint at an angle? Oh, good question. Yeah, one of my one of my most influential painters, Charles, the late great Charles Reed, he always seemed to be painting at at least a 20 degree angle, if not more. Uh, sometimes I do that, you know, that's how he got some of his beautiful runs in his in his paintings. Um, but I have a tendency to use so much water that I, I, I would constantly have to pat runs with my style because I really like to uh, flood the paper. So, no, I, I don't. OK, thank you. Certainly nothing wrong with that. I just don't do it. Okay. Now here we're going into like a lavender. So why not, 
See, the mess around can guide you with colors. This lavender looks great. So why don't I mix a lavender? So I'm going to swing my palette around. This is a palette with three mixing areas. And I already have a deep purple in there. So maybe I could just simply use that. And I like to look at an object and just kind of get the general flow and, and impression. So I'm looking at this and that's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna start right here. Fairly dark. And then pull it up like that. We'll see how this works out with all this tape on it. I even put a little bit right there. And then we've got the top of her head. Hair goes in a lot of different directions. You got all these, these strands that can go every which way. I want to, I want to feather it a little. So I'm going to bring out a strand there and maybe a few here. Something tells me to add a little bit of orange here. Maybe a little more there. Okay. Now I want to get this dark area. This is another shape with the, and there's dark hair here and dark hair here, and it's being bisected, or that's the right word with some light reflected strand going down vertically. I want to try and get that. And I see a lot of the red, the cool red here. So I'm going to stick with my alizarin red okay and it should start about right here i even put a little purple where it really gets dark there you know what i want i'm taking i want a little bit of that's what i want i want a little bit of yellow here a little bit there there You can see I like to move around the painting. Okay, so I'm continuing with this dark area. And it's going to be mostly just use the flat of the brush. Um Okay, there's that. Now, what's my next move? You know, painting, painting is, is just a, a constant flow of aesthetic. And in this case, it's color and value. It's just a constant flow of aesthetic decision-making. Sometimes it goes by real fast. You, you get the painting done within an hour or two. Other times it may take a couple of days. I never use a hair dryer I, 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 for two reasons. I want to see the paint, like I said before, dry on its own volition and settle naturally. And also it allows me to stop painting and maybe do something else like go downstairs and wash the dishes and come back with fresh eyes. I remember when I was a beginner, I would paint, 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 paint. Because you're so concerned about, oh, is my painting going to come out good? What's it going to look like? Um, 
but and and I would uh, use a hair dryer often. But all that does is it gets you tired, and you start you losing that aesthetic ability to do the right thing and to observe something correctly and follow through with the right painting stroke and the right colors. You want to stay fresh, so by not using a hair dryer. I come back with refreshed eyes, a better attitude. Oh, look, I, I want to get this little bit of the hair. That's right. And I traced it. That, that, should, be, that should be pure alizarin. There. And it kind of whips around like that. You want to get the flow of the hair. And then it's soft right in here. Very soft. Comes down. You know, I'll need a little bit of dark here on the cheek because that's going to define this highlight. I mean, I don't have to copy that exactly. We'll see what happens. Okay, now her hair is in a bun. I think there's a clippy here. I, I, I'm not going to bother with that, but it's definitely a bun. So I want to, so the hairs are going like this way. There's a circular thing. It's almost like a ball or, or a ball of yarn. So that's what I want to try and capture. Hair, hair is not easy. It takes a lot of practice. And even with all that practice, it, it's, it's definitely a challenge. It never is easy. Okay, uh, this is, there's a dark area. I, I want to get established this dark area at the top of the bun. So, I'm using a nice big brush. You don't want to take out a small, tiny brush. I've seen so many people, they'll bring out that tiny brush and, and they'll do little strands of spaghetti and they'll outline things. That ain't, that ain't good. I'm taking a little thin brush. I use this primarily for my signature or I'll use it to feather out hair. Okay, that's done. How are we doing with time? Oh my God, it's almost two o'clock. Hey, Jim, uh, can we go a little over? How are you with that? Um, I'm thinking, I'm thinking maybe, maybe at two o'clock, we want to get, have a like a short break and then you continue. Would that work? Oh, yeah. And I've got two hours. So I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, right? I'm done yeah. at three o'clock. Oh, yeah. beautiful. Yes. Sorry. I was panicking there. I'm not done. Okay. Let's continue. That makes me feel better. So I'm getting this ball look. And I want a little bit of uh, alizarin in there. I don't need too much detail. There's a dark area right here. It's almost like looks like a triangle. I want to get that next. That is right. And it kind of helps define the ball. Let's see, I got the uh, right here. Okay. Now we're going to get a little bit darker here. See, see how I'm bringing out the highlight of that strand? So 
So I've got that highlight. But I'm going to get confused if I don't start to render the ear. So I'm going to take a break from the hair and take a round brush. And I'm going to do the ear structure, which starts right here. Nice and dark. This is the top of the ear. With a wet brush, I'll finish that up. Then a little more of a purple and alizarin. This is the ear canal is right here, I can see. Right here. And it's a definite shape. And it ends up as a point down here. I'll take a wet brush now with a little bit of red on it. And I'll finish that up. But that doesn't look like much. We need that highlight on the ear. So you're thinking, wait, how are you going to get the highlight? You painted over it with a mess around. Well, it's only a light value. So we'll bring the highlight out by making the hair behind it darker. Watch this. I want a little more alizarin. Here's going in this direction now, sweeping across, kind of following the lines of my tape. So let's bring this around. Oh, and I'll also show you how I could, if I want, I can bring that white back with a chalk marker. I haven't showed you that yet. I just dabbed in a little orange. And it is a light area right here. That's where I put in the orange. Okay. Let's bring that structure down. So right here. There. And a little bit of value coming right up here. There. So you can see her ears starting to emerge. And I can cut some, uh, some hair across the ear, but it, I, it, I'm, I'm not ready to do that. I think what I want to do now is define the back of her neck, which is going to be going to be easy because that's where a lot of dark hair is. So let's go. And we got green. So let's let's mix up a green. And what and I don't have, I never buy green paint. If you've got blues and yellows, you're always going to be able to get a green. So I, I, I put down phthalo blue. A lot of phthalo blue. In fact, I probably should put down a little more because I know I'm going to need it. There. And then I'll add some yellow. So look at this. I can go from green to pure thalo blue. So I'm going to start out with pure thalo blue down right down here at her neck. And then I'm going to add some thalo right at the bottom. Feather it out a little. And as I come up, if you hear some bird song, that's my Audubon clock. Every hour you hear a bird chirp. Kind of cool. There.
This brush is too small. This is a large area. I think I need a little more phthalo blue. Now with a wet brush, I'm gonna kind of pull some of that paint around. Okay, and I want to get some wispy hair. If you don't do these, and they're, you know, they're there, if you look at it in the photograph, if you don't do them, then you, you, you render hair, it, it's just too, if the edges are too hard, it looks like the person's wearing a helmet. And I think I need a little bit of green up here. If you've got a color in one area, you might want to put it in another area just for a wee bit of color unity. That helps unify the colors. In fact, I'm thinking about putting some right here, just a little bit. Okay, I want to look at a previous painting I did. I'm not quite happy with the shape of the hair. That's better. It needs to, it needs to. Again, I want to get a rounded look. And I want to get that impression of the hair, dark in areas. I popped in some pure yellow there. I dipped in, I've got, I've got a gummy bit of yellow on my paint and I can go in there and I can add some highlights. Okay, and I'm almost ready to take a break. Um, I may have to sacrifice some colors from my original mess around because I do want to, I want to bring the colors, I want to unify the colors a bit better. Maybe I need some, since I've got, since a thalo is so dominant there, maybe I should have a little here. Even put a little down here, make that a little bit darker. And a little bit darker here. I think I better stop now.
There's some hairs across in the ear. And I'm going to take some of this blue off. Okay, I'm going to stop right there because that was a lot of painting and I can feel myself getting into that zone where I've expended so much energy, I'm now going to start making mistakes. So let's have a break. How long do we want it, Jim? Um, what do you say, five minutes? Yeah, let's do five minutes. That's let's take five. Okay. All right. All right, we're back. Okay, I want to get a little darker around the back of the ear, and that's going to bring out the ear. So I've already got a blue there, so I think I'm just going to go in with phthalo and kind of follow. The ear pattern. Now, where does the ear end? The ear lobe, the lower ear lobe lines up about right here. So I think, I think it's right here. Swings around like that. Yeah. So the ear comes along. So I'm going to push back deeper the value in the neck area here. In fact, I'm going to soften that line. There. Hey, I'll take a break. Let me show you what I do with a chalk marker. I'm going to go in there and put a bold highlight on the upper earlobe. Maybe a little bit of a highlight down here. Let's put some on the nose. Bridge in the nose. A little bit here, above the upper lip, it's subtle. And how about, how about right here? And then look what I can do. This is exactly, this, these chalk markers handle, because I think that they have gloss, they're exactly like watercolor paint. So watch me soften it. Look at that beautiful softening effect with a wet brush. And you, you, you can buy markers in hundreds of different colors. So they come in quite handy. But it's a little too early for me to get in that detail. I just wanted to show you to get that in. Okay. Um, Now, I told you that I use Sennelier watercolor paint, and it's got honey base. So let's see if I can pull off some. See these, we've got wisps of hair that have these beautiful highlights. I, I could do it in chalk marker, but if I want to be a little more subtle, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a highlight right here. Look how that takes off paint. There. There's a little wisp. I'll have one cutting through here. It's all done 
the brush is somewhat thirsty. You, you have to keep just enough water on it so you can scrub off the paint. Let's have one going this way. You have to be patient and keep scrubbing for the one here. Yeah. Okay. You know what? I think this is all going to become darker. And then I'll put in the highlights. Okay. And then I think I need a few more. Oh, that's I'm going to, I'm making another green there. A little more yellow in there. So I've made I've made some more green. Because you get some, I'm changing it to red. I want some more wisps. I just don't want the the top of her hair to be too flat. Okay. Um, I'm going to make the background here a little bit darker. And it's also going to define the top of her shoulder. And I'm going to leave her shoulder yellow. But the background. I like the way the back of her hair is blending. Into the background. And also, once all this is dry, the lines are going to pop out when I take the tape off. This is kind of like stenciling. Um, I, I don't know if, I, if in this demo I'm going to do a bunch of stenciling because it may be, you can, it's so easy to overwork a painting. I think that might be enough. And maybe another highlight across her here like that. Okay. Now I'm going to look at her face. Is there anything else I want to do on her face? And do I want to make the background a little darker? I think I will. Right down here. So I got some green here, I got some green here. This is helping unify the color just a wee bit more. Okay. Do I need anything on the face? I don't know. Um, I think I need some more highlight right here in the ear. And then I think I'm ready to take off some tape to see what this is starting to look like. But I'm pulling off some more just to define that earlobe.
Now I'm thinking I, I like the light here, the yellow and the white of the paper. But as we go back, I'm thinking about the background getting darker. I like that. Okay. So now what I've got to do, oh, I know the jawline. So while, while all this is drawing, I want to define that jawline a bit better. Remember, I wasn't too happy with it. Yeah. Yeah, look how that really pulls out the, the side of her face. I'm working on her shoulder again. I was gonna leave it that yellow, but um, I think I'll darken it. That might be enough for now. Okay, I think I'm ready to clean up my tabletop a little bit. That's still drawing. Let's get some of this paint off. I work on a glass, I got a glass top here. This is all glass. Okay. More clean. Good. Okay, let's set up the um, the painting this way now. So anyway, look, I mean, out of a mess around comes this young lady. So now what I want to do is take my X-Acto knife and let's start pulling off tape and see whether anything, any magic happens. I don't know. We know nothing's going to happen here. Because there's not enough value contract. But it, look, it happened right there. So as we go back, it's going to get more dominant. Oh, look at this. A little bit right there. I like that. Let's So it's, okay, good. I didn't want it to be too overwhelming. Of course, we're not done yet. Let's pull off this big one. Is that one? Hard to tell. I think I tore it off. I don't know. Well, here's one. Ah, no, that hasn't been torn off.
This one right here, starting at the eyeball. I'll start here. Can you, yeah, you can see that. Very tacky tape. Let's start over here. There, that works. Oh, that goes all, all the way to the back. Look at that, look at that nice line. That worked. Okay, let's be a little more methodical about this. I'm going to go very slowly. Oops, that. Okay. Let's start right here. There. Oh, yeah, look, that's nice. Very slowly. There. Ooh. Okay. We'll start at the tail end here. I can see the tape better. Very slowly. So you can see these lines. Now, if I don't like all these lines or if I want to push them back, I know I can take paint and paint right over it. There's usually always a solution. or modification you can do with your paint. Now this one, I'm, I'm losing track. Ah, here it is. Oh, that was that one, okay. Pick it up about right here. Oh, there we go. And there's one that looks like it starts right here. Yep. And that goes around like this. Some of these I made long, some of these I made short just for variety's sake. There. So, David, once you get all the tape off, would you do any stenciling then, or would you leave it the way it is? Let's take a break from, from this. I know it's kind of like watching grass grow. Um, no, I think the stenciling would be too much. Okay. I mean, in a way, this is stenciling with tape. No, what I would do, I want to show you another thing that I do. Um, I can add color. Also, I can brighten up that color by first laying down, oops, that's kind of a dirty marker. I don't like that. Yeah, by adding white like this. And then I add the yellow on top. That's I I I can literally make tints 
Um, let's take some orange. And actually, I think I want white first. So I lay down a base of white. I'll do it with several of these. And then I go in and I'll get a brighter yellow because I'm working on white. Maybe this yellow can continue. And I can soften it. It doesn't have to just stop with a wet brush like that. Let's do this. Let's continue it. And about right here, we'll soften it with a wet brush. So there's a segue from saturated color to lighter color. In fact, that, that, that could go throughout the whole thing. So let me take a few. Um, you know, I think I will do. I think I will try a stencil. Because the whole point of this demo is to show you some of the things, so, some of the embellishments and how I use them. So let me take off a few more of these. Has that been taken off? No. These are hard to see. There. Take off some more. I'm getting better and faster at this. Get better at plucking that off. Just the tip of my exacto blade. Here's a fat one right here. You got to keep the, the, the tape at a low angle, otherwise it will tear the paper. There. Yeah, if I can get a, a lot of this up, Jim, I can, uh, maybe I can stencil right on top. We'll see. That goes right through the here. That's nice. Almost there. Okay, so I like it, it's okay. Um, here's what I would do. And I may have to use a hairdryer. How much time we got? Oh, we got plenty. I'm gonna go in.
and they'll take off some of those lines. Let's get some green going. And we'll segue into some red. And let's see if we can take off some of this. See? It's, it's just like watercolor. Okay, I'm going to, you're going to hear a lot of blowing. I'm going to dry this. And then, you know what, I, I need to make this a little bit darker. And then I'll show you how the, the pencils work. Okay, ready for takeoff here. Okay. Keep this down. A stencil.
And this is the stencil I like to use, especially with that bun area. We'll get this flat. Okay, so you put the stencil down like this. Just one area. And tape it down there. Okay. You got my Mr. Clean magic eraser. You got to remember original. And I tear off little bits and pieces like this. And you submerge it under water. And then you have to squeeze as much of the water out as you possibly can. As well, you want paper towels handy. Okay, away we go. And you can paint or you can take off as much or as little paint as you want, depending if you want some areas to be subtle and other areas to be, or you want some areas to be a little darker value and other areas lighter. Like, look, I'll, I'll take off a little bit more. And as soon as they get dirty, they don't work as well. So that's why, I buy these um, magic erasers. I get them from Amazon. I get a box of them. So let me give you a little sneak peek of what's happening underneath. This out of the way. Look at that pattern. So let's keep going. Take another clean one because that one got picked up too much paint. At that point, you're just going to be applying paint to paper again. Oh, look how it's, and some colors you'll find will come off a lot quicker and easier than other colors. See, that's get that's getting real dirty. It's got to be tossed. Periodically, give it a pat, take off all the excess water. I can see this is going to have to be padded. But I think I can take off more paint. Now we've got a nice, almost like my tape, we've got some lateral and vertical action going on here. So you can see this is creating just a lot of beautiful texture on that here. I think some of this, I'm gonna put some right here and break up the, the border the here, just a little bit. And have that go right off the top. Had it. See, look how that just swings 
right off. So again, as you're doing this stenciling, you got to think about how you want to position it and you, you, you need to think about the flow. Um, I'm thinking right here, right like this, this part would be nice, right? Look at that, look how that swings around. So let's take another clean magic eraser and see what we can do. Boy, you gotta squeeze all the water out as much as possible. Okay. We'll break the border a little. Pat it. And I usually have some music going on in the background because this is slow, careful work. Now I'm not gonna pull off as much paint here, just a little bit there, but I will here in the back. Oops, no, that had too much paint on it. That actually added paint, but I, I can take it off with a clean. Look at that. So let's see what happened there. Yeah, there we go. So I'm going to stop there. I'm, I'm not done yet, but that's enough stenciling. What I want to do next. So you can see it's got this beautiful pattern on the hair. And my straight lines were not working, but I'm able to save the painting. I got a few here. I can, I can get rid of those later, but I am saving the painting by painting on top again, because I know I can stencil off a beautiful pattern. One more spot, I think. I want to go a little bit into the face. We got this thing going, remember? So we'll keep it going a little bit. Let's see what happens. Now, where am I? Where is my magic eraser block? Here it is, hiding underneath the paper towel. Okay. So let's let's go into the side of the face a little. Not not all of it. I'm just going to do little random areas. A little bit underneath the eye socket would be nice. Let's take that away. Look at that. That kind of blends it into the face rather than have that totally isolated. Take off. Okay, now let's put on some color. How about some yellow in here? So again, this is where I turn on the music and I, I take periodic breaks. I stand up and I look what I'm doing and decide, well, okay, what's my next move? You know what, this line here would be good. Let's just keep that in yellow.
And the yellow's really looking good right, right here in this area. And if I want to make it a little brighter, I'll first lay down some white chalk, like so. And then put the yellow on top. Sometimes I have to pat it on my hand to get fresh ink because as you're laying down this, these colors, it's also picking up some of the paint. In fact, I'm, I'm liking all this green. And then let's go. If I wanted to keep those lines, then I would say, okay, well, I want a little bit of that color someplace else. So I can put some here. I can also brighten these up a little with another layer. There's still enough value contrast and this color is so bright. And if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see a lot of videos where I'm demonstrating this. Where else? Well, let's try some yellow. There we go. What do you think? Does that give you a good idea? Take the tape off. So then the only other thing left to do, you know, if I was happy with this. Now, normally when I do this, I, I will spend maybe one or two days working on the colors. It can get quite elaborate. Sometimes simple, but other times quite elaborate. Oh, you know what I'm thinking about doing? Let's get some yellow. But if I was happy with it, I'll put on my signature. And I'm done. So you've got a good idea how um, how the stenciling works, how you can do things and then come back and fix it, how th this chalk marker works just like watercolor. You can put it on, you can take it off. So these three elements, the mess, four elements, the mess around, the emerging of the your subject from mid to dark values. And then after that, you can add the stenciling and you can add chart marking embellishments. So David, if I go into an art store and I wanna get your markers, they're called chalk markers, is that correct? Yes, and they come in different brands. Um, so you kind of have to experiment and see which brands give you uh, the best, most saturated colors. I like to use, this is a German brand. This is called Edding. You can get them on Amazon for sure. I'm sure some of the online art stores has them also, but I know that they, they're definitely, because that's where I get them, 
on Amazon. Okay. The other thing with the chalk markers is I was told by an art materials expert that over time, the, 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 this could, the chalk can start to come off the paper because it doesn't attach itself as strongly to the fibers of the paper. But to absolutely prevent that from happening, and I do this with all my watercolors because I hate putting my watercolors under glass. I'll mat them, I'll frame them, I might glue them onto cradle board, but I will not put glass or acrylic on them. I use Lascaux. It's got UV protectant, and you put one or two coats on this, and your watercolor is protected. You can spill coffee on it and use a sponge and wipe it off. And again, it's got the UV protectant. Golden also makes a spray varnish. But this Lascaux is the Mercedes, and I think it's worth the extra money. So if I want to keep this, I'll add two layers of spray varnish on top. And we have a question in the chat. Where do you get your stencils from? Good question. The, the, the stencil uh, company that has the, the most variety, and I only use stencils that, that don't have any representational patterns on it, you know, like stars or lambs or, you know, whatever. Um, but they make a whole range, whatever you want. Stencil girl, all one word, stencilgirl.com. And then I have a good friend that also designs stencils for a company. For instance, let me take this away, otherwise it's gonna get awfully confusing. This stencil. This is a Klimt, Gustav Klimt inspired stencil. And I've got a, um, I use this on a, a demo on my YouTube channel. Just, just, just go to David Lobenberg on YouTube and you'll get there. And she, she's made a number of them. She's also done this pattern. They're almost like, like roses. So she'll do representational and non-representational patterns. And this comes from a company called joggles.com. The stencils are a little less, the price point for, at joggles is a little less than Stencil Girl. My big stencils from Stencil Girl, like that one I use, you know, they're about, this size those go for about sorry for the reflection let me turn off that light they go for about fourteen dollars joggles i think you can get stencils for around ten dollars or less and they're still fairly large I don't like those little, if you go to an art store, a lot of art stores sell these little tiny stencils. They're five by seven. You want something that's going to cover a large area. I mean, you still may have to move it like you saw me do, but those, those little stencils are not worth it. So stencil girl or joggles. And I'm sure if you do your research, you'll find other companies. Do you ever use any stamping? You know, stamping is cool. I haven't done stamping yet. Okay. Um, I know Joggles. They sell some stamps. In fact, I may have. Let me show you. You know, I, I talked about pouncers. Here's a pouncer. So what I do is I put paint on it. And you got to put thick paint. It can't be soupy and watery. Real thick and you press the paint through the stencil. So there's two ways you can do it. 
you can use the magic eraser as you saw me and take off paint, especially if you got a lot of dark color, you take off paint. You know, I mean, look, look, look how it pops out. And of course, I made it pop out even more with the chalk marker. But if you have a light area, you can, you can go like white paint and pounce the, the paint through and you'll still get this, this pattern. And I'm looking for, oh, okay, here, I do have. And my friend designs these as too, these as well for, um, this is just a series of little, I don't think you can see them. Yeah, there you go. Little circles. So yeah, you, you brush paint on, I use a, a, a big flat brush and then just go this, carefully lift it up and you've got a beautiful pattern. But how big those patterns get from different companies, I don't know. These are smaller ones, but they they certainly do the trick. I just haven't played with them. I will at some point. <laughs> I'm sure you will. <laughs> well, it's a, been a very good demo, David. Thank you so much for showing us your, your techniques. It was really interesting. Thank good, you. good. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Happy painting. <laughs>